Welcome back to the channel. This is the cheapest, low mileage, clean title, third gen Viper that is in the United States. And today we're gonna cover everything that is wrong with it. I filmed this about a week after owning the car, but I wanna note that when I filmed this, it was way windier than I thought. So if the audio looks like it's a little bit off from the video, that's because I had to re-record all the audio and just overlay it after the fact. So I'm just kind of doing the best I can here. Now that said, let's get to it. First and foremost, biggest problem on this car, front to back, is the condition of the paint. Now the car was washed a week before this video, but you can already see it's extremely dirty because there's no real wax, there's no protectant, there's no sealant, there's a ton of swirl marks and scratches throughout the vehicle. It just wasn't properly cared for long term. This one on the fender is one of the absolute worst. I'm pretty sure they took one of those window brushes from a gas station and then scraped into the paint here on the fender. Just really deep, long scratches. And this is a consistent problem throughout the car. But on top of that, if you look anywhere that the sunlight is reflecting off, it's got that kind of spider web pattern coming out. Those are paint swirls, that's bad. It means they were using something relatively abrasive, leaving minor scratches throughout the paint. And you can see that literally front to back every square inch of this thing. I mean, it literally looks like the previous owner washed this thing with steel wool. And at this point, I've already taken it to a detailer. I had only lined it up when I filmed this video. And he actually said that himself. He's like, I literally think this car was washed with steel wool. It is that bad. And also, like I said, it is literally front to back. It was on the front fender, it's on this back deck lid. You saw it on the passenger side rockers. You're also gonna see it on the driver side rockers in a minute. I mean, this thing just had deep scratches all over. I just don't think the previous owner really knew what he was doing when he was caring for this paint. I think he bought this more as a status symbol. And that said, I am now the third owner of this car. The first person had it for two and a half years. The owner I bought it off of, he had it for 12 and a half years. He bought it when his business was taking off but he didn't really know how to use it. He wasn't really that much of a car guy or a hard driver. So I don't think it was driven hard, but I also don't think it was really maintained to the absolute top notch condition that it should have been maintained to. Now, fortunately, these are pretty reliable mechanically. They're very simple. At the end of the day, it is a Dodge. I think it's a bigger issue with regards to the paint. So like I said, I already got a quote for a full paint correction with a local shop near to me. And the quote at this time was like around $400 for a paint correction, which is actually a really good price. And the only reason I got a price that low was because the guy who owns the shop, he wanted to use this as kind of a worst case car that's also a high end car and to use it for advertising for his business and put it as like a showcase on his website. So for him, it's like a really good advertising opportunity and he kind of earns a customer out of it. For me, I get a really good deal on a paint correction. For a point of reference, every other shop that I asked for a paint correction was quoting me somewhere around twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Especially with how many contours and hard lines this car has, it's very difficult to do. So it's kind of a win-win with me working with this local guy, and he, apparently he does very good work. So I was actually really excited that that opportunity came up. Once that's resolved, I'll just have to keep the paint in good condition and not let it return to this state. Continuing with finish issues, next big issue is that all of these brakes generate a lot of dust. So you can see here, I swiped my finger into the brake dust after one week since this has been cleaned and brake dust is very corrosive. So not only does it build up very quickly, but if it sits there long-term, it'll actually eat away at the finish on wheels. It's very bad for the wheel finish. It's actually slightly acidic. So on one hand, there's a lot of dust, but there's also a lot of pitting and corrosion into the finish on these wheels. And then as you can also see, he curbed the crap out of this wheel and also the other three wheels as we'll show in a minute. Furthermore, only on the front driver's side, the rotor is absolutely chewed up. You can see these deep grooves on it and don't touch a brake rotor if the car has not been parked for a while. These things get extremely hot, you'll burn your finger. This one's been sitting a while, but I mean, you can really feel this whole groove with your fingernail. Uh, if you can snag it a little bit, it might be okay, but this isn't even close. I mean, this thing is like easy to snag. The other side by comparison is nice and smooth. This is how a rotor is supposed to look. That said, this wheel still has a bunch of issues. You can see big pieces of the finish that have chipped off, a bunch of curb rash here, and the corrosive brake dust will eat into this and help flake off that clear coat a little more easily over time, and that's what you're seeing here. All of this said, I am going to need to refinish these wheels because they are in such rough shape. On one hand, I would like to buy a new set of wheels, but I mean, these things are like 11 inches wide in the front and 13 inches wide in the rear. They are absolutely massive. You have to get custom wheels for these. They are also a six lug pattern, which is pretty much unheard of except for on pickup trucks. So then by the time you get custom wheels and then tires that are large enough to 
fit those custom wheels, I mean, you're a minimum of $4,500 to five grand into it. More realistically, you're probably seven to $8,000 into it. And I didn't buy the cheapest Viper because I have five to $7,000 to throw around on a spare set of wheels. I bought it because I'm poor. This really shouldn't come as a surprise. If I had that kind of money to throw at a set of wheels for a 16 year old car, I probably just wouldn't have bought the cheapest one in the country. I would have just paid that extra money towards a much cleaner example. Now, when you're doing front brakes on a car, you never do only one side. So I am gonna replace the brakes on both sides in the front, both pads and rotors. But other than that, the car is in very good mechanical shape. There's about 34 and a half thousand miles on it and the whole car is pretty much original. So popping the hood, which is done through the front bumper, if you didn't know on Vipers, and pro tip, if you do this without the keys, you will set off the car alarm, so please don't break into people's Vipers. But looking under the hood, this is an 8.3 liter V10. It's a big boy. So the previous owner, like I said, was not good at cleaning and detailing things. Really not his forte. This is just how clean the engine bay is. He never touched this engine bay. I did not clean it after getting it. But like I said, this car lived in a garage. This thing never saw rain. I got a really clean example on the inside that was mechanically sound that just needed some visual bits. But also, like I said, I don't think this thing was maintained from like a service interval standpoint as far as time or mileage is concerned. So going down to these wires, as I'm gonna show, it says 1-04. This is a 2004 car. That 1-04 is the manufacture date for these wires. So these are the original wires from January of 2004. These have never been changed at any point. And again, this is a 16 year old car. So it's probably never had the plugs or wires done on it. That's probably something I'll need to address in the near future just to keep this thing running as clean as possible given that these are almost two decades old at this point. The air filters look like they've been changed at some point. Those are really clean. But other than that, I am worried about the service history of this car. Because it's low mileage, I don't think it's paramount if you're just kind of putting around. But for what I like to do with my vehicles, and how I like to enjoy them. I think that's something that I will want to take care of. Same with like fluid changes. If this wasn't done, I doubt the transmission fluid's been changed. I don't know if the differential fluid's been changed. Stuff like that, that's like kind of a nice to have, especially if you really like to push the car at all. Those are just things that I would worry about that I don't think the previous owner did. On the plus side, it means there's no crappy parts on it. There's no aftermarket parts. I don't have to worry about low quality things being here on the car. And in fact, the only thing that is aftermarket on this whole car is the exhaust. So Vipers are notorious for having a cross pipe from the factory underneath pretty much like the passenger and footwell area that gets extremely hot. So that's actually not even just the benefit of the horsepower addition from the exhaust, but just the heat not being in the cabin, it's literally almost a burn risk from how hot the footwell gets with the factory exhaust. And the uh, aftermarket exhaust really adds to comfort while you're driving it as well. Even this one gets pretty warm, but I heard that the factory one is pretty much unbearable. Other than that, pretty much everything is untouched. So that's actually kind of a nice addition. Continuing with the small visual problems, a bunch of the badges on this car are starting to peel off. These are like stamped metal with almost like a 3M adhesive on the backside. So this ST10 is supposed to say SRT10. You can see that it's correct on the other side of the vehicle. Then around the back of the car where it says Viper, you can see the E is really peeling up on the corner. Now this seems relatively minor until you realize that when you go to buy these lettering kits, you only can buy all the letters for the entire car in a single pack. You can't only buy like individual ones and it doesn't come with the Viper logos. It only comes to the letters. Even so, the cheapest one I found is $200 for what are effectively some really thick stickers. So anything branding related on this car is just absurdly priced for what it is. And it's kind of these little nickel dime things that add up really quickly. Now my next problem isn't necessarily particular to this Viper. It's kind of a fiberglass car and Viper issue in general. But here I'm actually going to give you the full audio of my hood closing experience. I've heard Vipers in general have this issue, which I'm not exactly surprised by. While we're here, let's look at another of the two longest scratches of the car here on the hood, going all the way up 
and then all the way down the hood. Overall, the paint is absolutely trash, but then moving on to the interior, overall it's in pretty good shape. So there are aftermarket floor mats in here. You can see those are pretty beat down and worn through, especially near the clutch pedal. Beyond that, the driver's side seat bolster on the outside, it's not torn at all, but it's very much crushed in, probably from the previous owner getting in and out. Going back to the pedals, they have these little rubber grippy pads on them. They are only adhered on, so those have fallen off. There's only two left on the clutch pedal. There's a number missing on both the gas and the brake pedal as well. You can even see there's one here on the ground. So these are very easy to knock off. I am missing probably the majority of them at this point. The only other interior issues here on the window, they had to label the up and down direction for the window switch because pressing it up to put the window up was apparently not intuitive enough for them. And then there's a bunch of these little clips that are around. You can see here and here. I'm assuming that was for like a phone or something, but those are adhered on. So that's going to leave some sort of a residue if I pry that off. The last interior problem to note while we're here is that the alignment of the car is off. The wheel is turned right now, so the wheel isn't quite this far off center. The car tracks straight, but the wheel when the car is going straight is about 20 degrees or so to the left. So it's just enough to drive me absolutely crazy every time I get behind the wheel. Now the tread on the tires is good. Apparently the previous owner claims these were replaced two years prior to me buying it. These burnout marks were not me. I do not want to buy a $2,000 set of tires. Also, these are like half the width of my wheels. That's how you know they were not left by me. This is just a random parking lot that was near my house. Now, I didn't show it in this video, but moving on to the next issue is the dampers on the trunk. The trunk is pretty big and heavy, but if you leave it alone for any period of time, it will close itself. It can't really support the weight of this trunk for an extended period of time given that these dampers are something like 16 years old. On top of that, the trunk has worn through the edge of the soft top a little bit here. It's kind of rubbing probably here on the back of the trunk. So it's not really an issue for me because this is like a 500 plus horsepower car with no stability control, no traction control. So I don't wanna drive it in the rain even if it did have those features, but not having those features, I'm definitely not going to drive it in the rain despite my life insurance policy because I am not absolutely out of my mind. In general, the water seal on the front of the cars I heard is not the best. The previous owner said that if it's like a heavy rain or something, the front of this one might leak as well. But again, I'm not really anticipating that to be an issue because I don't really want to use it in those conditions. So there you have it. That is everything wrong with the cheapest Gen 3 Viper in the United States. Honestly, very good mechanical condition overall. Like I said, needs some basic tune-up and refreshing stuff, but other than that, really not a whole lot wrong with it other than the front brakes and needing an alignment. That said, for the price I paid for this, even relative to the current market value, is so cheap that like, can I really complain about needing a couple hundred dollars of things when the paint correction alone is gonna solve 95% of my issues with this vehicle? This is not only my dream car, but by far the most fun car I have driven, bar none. Every time I take this thing out, I am smiling ear to ear the entire ride. It is just an absolute blast. Yes, it only gets 12 miles per gallon. That's like a V10 problem. That's not really an issue with this one specifically. Yeah, the fuel economy is bad. It's got some weird quirks that are kind of just sports car problems. But overall, I think I'm very happy with the decision so far. Again, biggest risk I've ever taken financially was purchasing this thing. However, I'm absolutely in love with this thing so far. They say don't meet your idols, but I have enjoyed every single moment with this car so far. So that is all I have for this episode. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.